With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good Thursday evening, everybody, and welcome to Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. Welcome to the program here in the Situation Room. As always, I am your host, Caleb Colquitt, and it's a pleasure to be with you, as always, whether you're joining us on YouTube, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitch, Mixer. We're on Mixer now, and hopefully this should be the first show that we've got it back. I apologize to all of our Mixer viewers that... Haven't been able to watch us the past couple days. We had a technical issue, and it's been a mess, but we actually do, uh, we, we are up, and we should be back on Mixer now. So however you're joining us, we appreciate you being here on the program with us. And it is Thursday, and it is a Thursday during the Alabama legislative session. And for those of you that have been paying attention to the program for any length of time, you know what that means. We have a special guest on the line right now, as always, from Eagle Forum, Alabama. Becky Gerritsen is on the program with us. Good afternoon. How are you? Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you. we we got to stay uh, up to date on what's going on here at the local level. And uh, I've always said, and, and you know this has been a mantra of mine for a long time, if we're going to be small government, federalists, conservatives, constitutionalists, then we have to be more involved at the local level because that's the vision our founders always intended is that the local government is the most important government. Mm, very good. All right. So one of the first things that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, and, and you and I had uh, had some correspondence about this, uh, Senate Bill 56, which involves immunization tracking. Yes. And this is one that I feel like has really largely flown under the radar. I haven't seen any big articles about it on AL.com or Yellowhammer or WSFA. So uh, if you could give everybody a brief primer for, for people that don't know what all is entailed in this particular bill, what all does this bill purport to do? Well, this is a this is a great question. Um, this bill did come out last year as well in the House and the Senate, um, but luckily it was stopped. But it's rearing its ugly head again, and there are just a couple of problems. And I haven't read all of the synopsis on every part of it, but what some of the folks that have a vaccination um, Facebook page have really been reading through this bill. Mm -hmm. And what they are the most concerned about is that patients' rights to medical privacy are really in danger because of this. And what it is, is it's a, a tracking bill. It's an immunization tracking bill where they will have a statewide database that actually hooks into a national database so that they will be able to track all of the vaccines that a person has. Is that national and, database, uh, is that one that is run by the CDC? It is. Okay. It is something that is run by the CDC, but we have our own version of that, um, but they kind of want to scrap that and, and tie into the, the, the national database. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's voluntary. It's a voluntary immunization registry in Alabama. And it takes, you know, all kinds of information. Um, but what is going to happen now is that, well, in last year's bill, they would even be able to track your medical costs and insurance information. And then these this database is shared amongst different agencies. So there were really concerns about HIPAA violations as well. But then being able to, if this tracks back to the schools, then are kids going to be harassed or parents harassed mm. if they have a religious exemption? And then they're not allowed to do certain things. And I'm, we're still working through a lot of this, but there will be a public hearing okay. at 1030 at the state house on this bill. And the house bill is HB 103. And 
I will, since it's kind of early Thursday, um, our out, our weekly updates go out on Friday. Mm -hmm. So if, if your listeners are not yet receiving our updates, if they go to alabamaeagle.org and join our email list, there's a tab across the top where it says something like get active and just, you'll see where you can add on to our email list. Then I will have more detailed information about this and we'll know more than I know at this very minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely one I think we need to keep our, our eyes on. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me about this, and unfortunately this is sort of the nature of politics. I know that you've seen this firsthand just as much, if not more than I have, because you've actually run for office on a lot of individual issues. What happens is it's almost like we're afraid of, of doing any thinking or, or work because we hear something and we automatically go to our corner and I, my big fear with this is that a whole bunch of people are going to look at this bill and they're going to see it in terms of two camps, the pro-vaccine side and the anti-vaccine side. Mm -hmm. and, and with this, I really think that's a mistake because it's more of a privacy issue than it is a pro yes. or anti-vaccine issue because I'm very pro-vaccine. I've had mm -hmm. all my shots. If I don't have any kids, but if I had kids, they would get all their shots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't right. mean that I think that we should, we have to violate our, our privacy to be able to do that. Right. And one of the things, and I totally agree, this is more of sort of a liberty issue as well, mm -hmm. but the patient is not even able to consent to sharing of their information. And that just kind of goes against patient rights as well. So I, I think you're right. A lot of people will make this into a vaccine, anti-vaxxing kind of issue when really mm -hmm. it's more of a liberty privacy issue. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, and I've not read a ton on this bill, but it seems to me like the bigger issue isn't even the data collection itself because the Department of Public Health, of course, they have to track certain things, how many vaccines are given, that kind of thing. And we understand that. And there's a, and granted, this is hard for me to say as a libertarian minded person, there is a legitimate function of government here to a degree. But to me, it seems like the larger issue here is pairing that information with personal data. Exactly. For example, they would be using um, a person's income status. Now, do you want that to dictate your constitutional rights or your medical privacy? You know, that just doesn't seem right that they're able to do that. Oh, absolutely. Now, do you know, and, and you may not know at this point or not, but uh, would this enable the Alabama Department of Public Health to share that information without consent to entities yes. like doctors, as, pharmacies, schools, that kind of thing? As I understand it, now take this with a grain of salt, and in my review that I do, it'll be, I'll have a better answer, but as okay. I understand it, the um, Alabama Department of Public Health, they do not have to follow the HIPAA rules like everybody else. And I, I forget why, because it's certain agency, it's different. I think it's like medical authority is the designation yeah, they're given. Right. So, yes, but I do think that they are able to share that information and they can share it with all kinds of people. Yeah. Like you said, um, even, you know, phlebotomists, lab assistants, mm -hmm. pharmacists, you know, all school board members. Uh, there's a whole list of things where there are people that they're able to share this with. Well, see, and they would be granted access to this private information under this bill. Right. And this is where it runs into a problem because the HIPAA laws are there to protect, of course, your, your medical privacy. And they could say, well, you know, just because your, your doctor has this information, they're not allowed to share that with anybody, but the Alabama Department of Public Health. But if the Department mm -hmm. of Public Health can then turn around and share that data that they are given with other people, then the HIPAA law makes... I mean, they're, they're, they have to go through an extra party to get that information, but they still have access to the information. So what's the difference? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the concern comes in. Yeah, I agree. So this one will be, um, I'm assuming at least in many cases, the bills are going to go faster through the Senate mm -hmm. because there aren't as many people and it's right. kind of easier to get things through. So I now, this is in the House. This bill right now is going to make it, you know, is in the House Health Committee. But I'm assuming it will make it out easily out of the Senate 
as well. So we'll we'll have better update for you next week on where it is. But if anyone is interested mm. at 1030 at the state house, they can go and it's actually a public hearing. So if you have problems with this, then you are certainly allowed to speak up about it. You'll probably have two minutes max to say what you want to say, but the public is welcome to do that. OK, so I, I really wanted to ask one last thing that interested me about this. Uh, because I found found this out, even if families get a religious exemption, for example, uh, that they get from the Alabama Department of Public Health, they're still in the system. Right. So like, even if you opt out of having a vaccine, because they're the ones that you have to essentially get the license to not get vaccinated from, your personal information is still with them, and they yes. can still presumably share that with third parties, including public schools and, and other entities. Yes, Yes, that's how I understand it as well. Well, I don't know. That just that strikes me as so profoundly un-American because <laughs> the, the idea of having to go to the government to get permission to not do something in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's one thing that I understand the licensing system, though I think that we overdo that a little bit. I, I get why we need to be able to license people, for example, to drive or to practice medicine or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand going to the government to get permission to not do something. Right. But anyway. All right. Uh, so moving on, I know this is another one that, that we talked about pretty extensively last week. Uh, but there's an update on, on where this is going. House Bill 35, the GIRL Act. Oh, thank you so much for bringing this up. Yes, big yeah. update on this today. So I, I want to just stop and let you all know a, a couple of sad things that happened this week for the legislature. Terry Collins, the chair of the education committee, mm -hmm. her husband passed away on the weekend with a heart attack. Oh goodness, I did not know and that. We were just so shocked to find that out. So they had the funeral indicator yesterday. So mm -hmm. they canceled all of the house committee meetings yesterday. Mm. And now they did that. And little did we know that the health, I'm sorry, this, um, state government committee met today on the girl act as a public hearing i had no idea i thought it was going to be next week so this is the, the bill s i'm sorry hb 35 that will ban boys from playing in girls sports yeah well the reverse so, is also true but primarily it was focused yes. on that. <laughs> right right it, and you know just the unfairness of the size and strength of sure there is a difference between men and women and boys and girls and so, we just got demonetized from youtube thanks becky <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> no know, i'm probably, kidding go ahead i know no you're probably right but what i wanted to say was unfortunately the sponsor or i would I guess say it was the sponsor. He. Yeah. Representative not, Pringle, right? He did not get witnesses to speak at this public hearing and that's not good. So apparently there, I want to say there were six people that spoke against the bill and no one spoke in favor of the bill. Now, had I known, of course I would have been there. I just, sure. I really thought it was next week. So what happened was they did not vote on the bill. He could not get anyone on that committee to say, yes, we should let this bill go through the committee and go onto the floor for debate. Hmm. No one would even make a motion to do that. So it's been carried over. It will come back up next week. Okay. And of course, so it's we, not it dead won't in the be a public hearing. No, it's not dead, um, but it is tabled. So we do expect it to come back. And that will also be in my update. It is time now for people to contact the state government committee and say, Hey, this is an important bill for women and mm -hmm. it needs to be passed out of committee. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that this news actually comes on the same day that in Connecticut, three girls just filed a lawsuit against the mm -hmm. state of Connecticut for their, uh, allowing men that are dressed as women to compete in mm -hmm. their sport. And the interesting thing about this is the legal grounds that they are making that case on is that it is an actual violation of title nine. Mm. That they're saying that because they're allowing men to compete against women, that it's actually a violation of the equal rights clause in Title IX that suggests that women have to have equal opportunity in sports as men. Yeah, interesting. Which, I mean, I think makes sense, but I yeah. don't know how a, a court will, will take that. Um, but uh, so this it looks as though it's it's not dead in the water. It's going to be brought up again, which is comforting. Now, 
I kind of had to bring this up because when I saw this, I, I just had to bring this to my audience's attention. Uh, did you hear about the conversation that John Roberts gave on this particular uh, bill? No. And are we talking, okay, John Roberts as in... John Rogers, sorry. Uh, okay, Rogers. Yes, representative. Yeah. Okay. No, I did not. Tell me about that. Okay. So you're going to get a kick out of this one. Uh, State Representative John Rogers, for those of you that, at home that may not remember, John Rogers is the uh, the guy that kind of has a habit of flying off the handle and talking out of his butt when it came to mm-hmm. abortion. Even Doug Jones is like, wow, that guy's a little too radical on abortion for me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> if that gives you any indication of who this guy is. He said, and I quote, my favorite player is a transgender. I don't recall his name. About 20 football players are transgender. Now, are, are you aware of any mm-hmm. professional football players, college football players that are transgender? I don't, but that doesn't mean... <laughs> now, yeah, I, that's interesting. Well, here's... Because here's, Yellowhammer News caught up with him and asked him for clarification. Mm-hmm. He was talking about Cam Newton. Who what? is not a transgender. <laughs> now, no. granted, seeing some of the pictures of some of the things that Cam wears, maybe you could get the idea mm. that he was transgender, but he's not transgender. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, uh, no, not at all. He said, no, I got confused. I thought that it was uh, transgender was the same thing as gay. So there, there's no, oh, no it's yeah, there's totally different. no, no law in the books trying to keep gay people from participating in high school athletics. This is specifically for people trying to compete in a different sport other than the one that with the gender of, of people that they were born in. But anyway, uh-huh. I just, uh-huh. I found that terribly amusing. John Rogers putting his foot in his mouth again. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So check this out. I mm-hmm. was looking today to see what new bills have gotten filed and you're going to get a kick out of this. Oh, this is. HB 238, it's by Representative Hollis. She's a Democrat. This bill would require a man to undergo a vasectomy within one month of his 50th birthday or the birth of his third biological child, whichever comes first. (laughs) Crazy. Now, I'm sure it's a joke, but it says um, down in the actual law part, it says a man at his own expense shall undergo a vasectomy within one month of his 50th birthday or the birth of his third biological child, whichever comes first. This act shall become effective on the first day of the third month following its passage and approval by the government. Isn't that crazy? Now, I'm, Th- I'm they've sure got to be making a statement a or something. Yes. Like, yes. I just had to laugh, though. No, yeah. it is funny. Um, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I'm actually going to have Senator Andrew Jones on, hopefully Monday, if not Tuesday. We'll mm-hmm. just have to see what his schedule allows uh, mm-hmm. to talk about his grocery tax bill. Have you been following this one at all? I have not been following this. Now, a, a bill that I'm very interested in is Mike Holmes's fair tax bill. Mm -hmm. Um, Eagle Forum has not endorsed the bill yet. Um, We may actually do that, but we have not done that yet. But it is, I am really liking so much of what he's doing, which would completely take off the table the grocery tax. Right, because the grocery, yeah. yeah. You're right. No, I I have not, um, I don't know the details of, of Mr. Jones's, Senator Jones. Yeah, so, so w- I tell you what, since since you're not studied up on it and I haven't studied up on it as much as I feel like I need to, what we'll do is we'll just kind of table that and let uh, the, the sponsor of the bill actually speak about that since he'll be on the show later anyway. So okay. uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about is the medical marijuana bill, ah. which made it out of committee in the Senate, I believe. No, actually, it just they dropped it yesterday. OK, so, so it hasn't made it assigned- out of committee yet. Right. It's it will be it's 85, 83 pages long. I'm only to page 28 so far. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a little bit about the bill, but it will be in committee, the Senate Health Committee at 830 on Wednesday morning. It will be a public hearing. So, of course, it will be filled with people who want marijuana and maybe a handful who are against it. But look, I have I a feeling you? that will be a colorful crowd. <laughs> it will be. It, it always is. Definitely. You can just kind of just look at the people and, and tell. Let yeah. me t- show you though. Um, can I read you the list of conditions that are. Oh, please do. Okay. So there's 15 conditions. I think last year there was like 23. So they've, they've brought them down, but I want you just to think 
how easy it is to fake some of these things. Okay. Okay. Anxiety or panic disorder, autism spectrum disorder, cancer related nausea and vomiting, um, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, fibromyalgia, HIV AIDS, persistent nausea that is not significantly responsive to traditional treatment, um, PTSD, sleep disorders, spasticity associated with motor neuron disease. I'm assuming that would be like ALS kind of things. Yeah. Um, spasticity associated with MS or spinal cord injury, terminal illness in which life expectancy is six months or less, Tourette syndrome, a condition causing chronic or intractable pain in which therapeutic conventional therapeutic intervention doesn't work, mm -hmm. um, and any other medical condition added by the commission. Wait, so it also leaves open a blank check at the end there? Yes, yes, totally. Well, then what's the point of having the first 14 conditions? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I, that's just interesting. Now, there's a lot to this bill. This bill actually goes into the, the patient registry, how a doctor mm. is able to become certified, and it sets up the Marijuana Commission, and that's why it's such a lengthy bill. But Right, because there's a lot of infrastructure that has to surround mm -hmm, something like this. Right. Yeah. This actually will be in a room where you can listen online, so if you can't make it to the hearing, I'm sure it'll be very interesting. This is one of those, you want to bring your popcorn because it's a lively crowd, and it's Or it's if you're on the other side of this debate, your Doritos. Well, there you go. Right. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's at 830 on Wednesday morning. So right. we have a really big week coming up. Oh, for sure. Now, one thing I wanted to ask about this specifically, and, and like you just said, the, the reason that this bill is a hefty one, the reason there's a lot of detail is because this actually sets up a seed to retail tracking system. Yes. So everybody that grows it, everybody that cultivates it, everybody that processes it into a product that can be used for the end user, all the retailers, yeah, like they, right. They have to cover mm -hmm. every aspect of that. So um, based on what you've seen, at least so far, do you think that that would be adequate to keep it from getting, you know, lost or in the hands of people that aren't supposed to legally have it? Um, I don't think so due to the number of dispensaries that will be allowed. But I, again, I'm only on page 28. I got a, I've got a long way to go. Fair enough. But that was one of my, one of our big concerns last year is, you know, are you going to have dispensaries in every county, mm -hmm. several in every county? Will municipalities be able to control anything? And I don't, I think at this point they don't, they don't like have any jurisdiction over some of these dispensaries. But again, I'm only on page 28. I've got a, a ways to go. Okay. Well, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that one. And hopefully there will be some people that have some free time can tune in to that one. And you said it's Wednesday at 8 a.m., correct? Wednesday at 8.30. And it is SB 165. Again, if you go to alabamaeagle.org and get on our email list, that'll be sent out tomorrow. And I'll have links to the bill and, you know, times of and room numbers of where these committee meetings are going to be. Right. Definitely something if, if you want to stay dialed into this, if you want to keep your eye on it, that's definitely the best way to track it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else going on over yeah. that you want to talk about? I, I really want to mention another really sad thing that happened this week. We have a Teen Eagle program where we have teenagers that come and intern with us and they meet monthly and they do all kinds of neat things, learning about liberty and, you know, conservative values. Sure. One of the families, um, two of their children went with us just a couple of weeks ago to St. Louis to our big Eagle Council yearly meeting in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. what, the daughter was 13. Her name is Sarah. And then the 17 year old brother came. Well, they have a middle brother who's 15 mm -hmm. and he passed away on Monday. And we were just absolutely shocked. Um, he came down sick on Friday with what they thought might be the flu. And by Sunday, he was having seizures, liver failure, kidney failure, brain swelling, and he passed away on Monday. Mm. So it's the Claghorn family. And I just would love everyone to pray for their family. And as we get funeral arrangements, you know, we'll try to keep those posted. Um, but this is just a really great family. They've got yeah. seven children and it's their 15 year old. He was just completely healthy. And now he's gone. So... Yeah, and, 
and that happens sometimes. And it does. It's I mean, just devastating. My, my dad was a teacher for a long time, and uh, even in our little bitty school, we had tragedies like that that were just totally out of the blue. And and it is different when a young person passes. Like yeah, that. It's just so sad. So but, uh, it kind of hit us hard too, you yeah. know, because they were connected with us in a really neat way, and so. Just everyone keep your prayers. And, and again, for Terry Collins and then Jim Carnes, he's another representative that right before the session started, his wife of about four and a half decades, she passed away. And that was really, you know, she had been ill for a few months, but it we just couldn't believe that she passed away. A year ago, she was mm. looking amazing and we would have just never thought anything like this would have happened. So. A lot of sadness to there start really off is. this session. And and sort of just in the larger uh, context of that as well, because I've known Representative Collins for at least over a year now. She's been on mm. my program at least mm. once, I think twice. So I know her, and, and that's uh, just a horrible thing, especially with somebody being as family-oriented as she is. Right. That's just, right. I, I can't imagine what she's going through right now. Yeah, and opening week he was up at the state house with her mm. you know every I thought everybody thought he was fine and you know i think he was fine but it just tragedy can strike and just any time so love your loved ones and tell them how much you love them for sure and and this is a little bit off topic but you know in the news radio 1440 family we're dealing with some stuff right now too because uh of course he's a nationally syndicated host but everything oh. that happened with rush limbaugh like yes um advanced stage lung cancer is tough like mm. lung cancer is one that's actually very survivable if you catch it early on but because it mm -hmm. moves through the body so quickly if you catch it late stage that's just very difficult to get rid of yeah yeah, um, I just and, and I had late you. stage testicular, but it just doesn't travel very much, and, mm -hmm. and lung cancer does. So, mm -hmm. uh, of course, we're praying for him as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll keep you posted on all of these exciting bills, and look forward to talking to you next week. All right, and as always, we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Becky. You are welcome. Have a great day. You too. That is Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. As always, it's a pleasure to have her on our show and uh she will be with us every thursday for the foreseeable future at least until the session ends to give us all the updates and again if you do want to check out her newsletter get all the updates from eagle forum alabama go to alabamaeagle.org to sign up and get those updates because look it's great that she comes on the show I love it when she's on the show. There's a reason that we have her on every week because the work that she's doing and, and tracking all this is that important but we can't squeeze it all into a 30-minute program. It's just not possible. And so if you do want to stay up to date and, and keep track of all the bills that are going on, we try to hit the highlights, but there's a lot more that is going on over there. So if you want to stay informed, that is definitely the way to do that at alabamaeagle.org. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a minute on Tactics. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Tactics. Thank you so much for being with us. However, you're listening to the program. We always appreciate it. Now, this next story, anybody that knows me and saw that this story came out, they had to know immediately that this was going to be on my show eventually because I, I've i always loved this story. This is a story that goes back, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, 14 years now? Yeah, 14 years when this video originally came out, and, and we're uh, getting some new news on it. So uh, for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, this is something that actually happened in tw uh, 2006, which is so weird to think that 2006 was 14 years ago. But I digress. So in 2006, there was a story that came out in a local Mobile affiliate, so right here in Mobile, Alabama. There was a story that launched about a bunch of people in Mobile, that thought they saw a leprechaun. I'm not making this up. This is a real thing, and if you haven't seen it, I can only estimate for the past 14 years you've been living under a rock. So I will make this one exception. I never do this. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, what you need to go is pause my video right now and then go into the next tab over in YouTube and search for Mobile Leprechaun, and you need to watch it. I, I give you permission. You, it's okay to pause the show this one time and go watch it if you haven't seen it before, and it is hysterical. 
So a bunch of people got together, thought that they were seeing a leprechaun, and there were a lot of different explanations. Some people thought that uh, maybe the light was just filtering through the trees at just the right angle, and because of that, people thought that there was the something that looked like a leprechaun, like the shape of the branches made it look like one. There were a lot of different theories on this. A whole bunch of people cited that they had, a, had actual leprechaun sightings there in Mobile. And because of that, this local NBC affiliate wound up doing a report on it. It went wildly popular, went viral all over the internet. I mean, I've met people that have never even been in the Southeast that know about this video. <laughs> I have friends all over the country, and several of them, uh, one I'm thinking about in particular that lives way up north, never even been close to Alabama and knows about the Mobile Leprechaun. So it was kind of cool that a, a local news story, and, and especially for this local NBC News affiliate, became wildly popular with one of these videos. And the report is pretty good. Like, it, it's, it's very entertaining. And in the report, they have an amateur sketch of what people reported the leprechaun looked like. And so here's where the thing gets interesting. And the reason that we're talking about it here 14 years after it happened, the mobile leprechaun is making its way through the news cycle again because there is a beer company that now has featured the drawing of the Mobile Leprechaun on its beer. So this is the, uh, the amateur sketch of what the Leprechaun looked like that they used in that news report. And as you can see, it's the same one. They actually put it lines and all with the notebook paper on this can of beer. <laughs> so the uh, Parish Beer Company which, by the way, is based out of Louisiana, so uh, another area of the country that has a lot to do with Mardi Gras, much like the original home of Mardi Gras, Mobile, Alabama. Not a lot of people outside the state of Alabama actually understand or know that. If you ever meet somebody from Mobile, Alabama, they will tell you multiple times and never shut up about it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure that I have a large contingency of my audience that also is either from Mobile or has family down there. And, and if you ever bring up the subject of Mardi Gras, sit back and, and get ready to listen. Because if there's anybody anywhere near the Mobile area, they'll tell you about how it's a common misconception that it happened in uh, Louisiana and Mobile is the original home for it. Which, by the way, I'm sure is probably true. It's just funny how they continue to talk about it. it you know, it's fine. I, I had a roommate back in college that was from Mobile, and every time someone brought up Mardi Gras, we were about to hear about how the real home of Mardi Gras is in Mobile, but regardless, uh, props to the Parish Brewing Company for coming up with something that's cool. It's nice that they're giving a, a little uh, shout-out to that, a little reference back to that, and it will be available from Fat Tuesday to St. Patrick's Day. Now, y'all know I don't drink beer, it's a really cool thing. If this were on, say, a can of soda, you better believe that I would at least buy one and try it, but it's a beer, so I don't really have any interest. But, you know, it's cool that the company does that. And here's the thing. The reason that this thing is on a can of beer, the reason Mobile is being put in the spotlight, and the reason that this thing went viral in the first place, is the news decided to have a little fun. Like, nobody took the leprechaun story seriously. Nobody was thinking that there were real leprechaun sightings. The people in the video, they were saying that they did, but they were playing up to the camera, and they knew it, and the news people knew it. And that brings me to my point in all this. I mean, not that we're going to get real deep and philosophical on a segment about leprechaun beer, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it's okay for the news to have fun. Sometimes it's okay to goof off. Y'all know that one of the big sites that I visit and, and post a lot from is Babylon Bee, and that's because the truth is the news is often so depressing and serious, and it's always with people at each other's throats. Sometimes it's good to just kick back and have fun with a news story that everybody can agree with, everybody can get some entertainment out of. And because this local news affiliate here in Mobile did that one time, here they are, 14 years later, still getting traction out of it, still getting publicity from it, and, uh, you know, letting people know that the people in Mobile, Alabama, they know how to have a good time, they know how to have fun. That's a good message. It's good when news actually brings people together, as opposed to always driving them apart, and that's always an encouraging thing to see. It's always something that I like to see, being somebody that's in the news and in the media myself. That being said, it is time for the Daily Dose 
of stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. And for today's Daily Dose of Stupid, y'all, I don't know how many more reports I'll have to do on this for the next coming months and, and quite arguably another four years. Trump derangement syndrome, 100% real. And it is a heck of a disease. It spreads much like the coronavirus, sometimes without people even realizing that they are sick when they're carrying it around. Um, but here's the thing. Normally, when we talk about Trump derangement si syndrome, TDS, as it's been come to, to be known, usually we're talking about Democrats. That's what, you know, is kind of par for the course. It doesn't just affect Democrats. It really affects anybody that, A, hates President Trump, and B, allows that hatred to cloud their judgment and cloud their rational thinking. And unfortunately, this does happen to more than just people that are Democrats. So um, to provide a little bit of context to the audience, if you haven't been a long-term fan of mine, if you weren't paying attention to my show in the 2014, 2015, 2016 years, one thing that you probably don't realize about me, unless I've mentioned it sort of looking back, is that I was never a big Trump fan. In fact, I was a member of the Never Trump movement. Now, when the man took office, I did what I thought was the fair thing, and I said, from this point on, I will only judge his conduct as president as what has happened since he's been in the White House. I will only judge his job as president based on this day forward, which, by the way, was a standard I applied to President Obama. I thought that was fair. Now, the difference is President Obama proved very quickly that he was exactly what we thought he was before he got elected, but nonetheless, with President Trump, there were a lot of things I was wrong on. A lot of things I was right on, too. But mostly, I was wrong. A lot of my fears about him not being a conservative, about him kowtowing to the Democrats and governing far more liberally than any of his Republican colleagues that were running against him in that primary, turned out to be completely wrong. Now, I still think that there were better options in that primary, and I still think that given the information that I had at the time, I probably made the right decision, and my skepticism was not unfounded. But at the same time, I'm not too big to admit, I was incorrect. But unfortunately, some people in the Never Trump movement that were there with me back then, I don't you know, think of these specific people as allies, and one I'll, I'll get to in a second, but some of them never were able to let that grudge go. And I think that it's really sad because you're even hearing some of these people that are suffering from Trump derangement syndrome in the never Trump camp that were back there then, they've been provided with lots of new information and have yet to change their mind. Now, I'm not saying that a person, uh, it is inconscionable for a person to even consider voting against President Trump. I don't play that game. Frankly, I haven't 100% decided that I'm going to vote for him this time either. I always reserve judgment for every race until right up before it happens. And that's part of the reason I delay telling people who I'm going to vote for until right up before the election. And that's something I stand by. I haven't 100% made up my mind that I am going to vote for President Trump this time. There's a lot of time between now and then, and something could happen. But what I don't want to become, and that I'm at least glad that I never did become, were people that are so blinded by that dislike of President Trump. There's days where I really don't like him either. There's days where I really like him. But I've never let my original dislike for the president keep myself from admitting that he could ever do anything good or to be able to objectively look at something that he's done versus something that another politician either has done or would have done in his position. So I want to draw your attention, that being said, to a couple of tweets here that I think are suffering from the Trump derangement syndrome that are not actually Democrats. So this one is from Bill Kristol. For those of you who don't know Bill Kristol, he was with uh, a long-standing conservative news magazine for a very long time. It's out of business now, but uh, he ran that for a long time. And so here's Bill Kristol's tweet 
Uh, well, sorry, that's uh, that's Joe Walsh. Well, you know, we'll just read Joe Walsh's first then. Uh, so this is Joe Walsh, who recently dropped out of the presidential race. He was actually running against President Trump. He was trying to be a primary uh, opponent of his. So Bill Cr- or Joe Walsh says, one, Donald Trump is a unique and dangerous threat to our republic. He must be stopped. All of us must come together to stop him. Therefore, I pledge to support whoever the Democrat nominee is. And then if you if a libertarian slash conservative like me can make that pledge, can't you? Now, there's a couple things I want you to take away from this. First of all, if you are a conservative libertarian, I do not understand how on earth you can make the statement that you pledge your support to whomever the Democrats nominate. Even if you had the full field that was there at the beginning, I still couldn't see that, but especially now when you've got it narrowed down to a communist in his 80s, a full-blown communist that honeymooned in the Soviet Union that believes in nationalizing all the banks, nationalizing health care, and his slightly less radical but pretty much exactly the same counterpart, Pocahontas herself. And then you've also got Joe Biden, who for the longest time was the most radical senator on the left, all about some government control, all about government spending. Uh, You could go through Pete Buttigieg, who wants full-on socialized medicine, now, his wouldn't destroy all of private health care, but it would, it would destroy most of it, and it would basically socialize medicine for the United States. It would take us more to something like Canada has, where they have a private health care sector for the, the uber-rich, but pretty much everybody just falls back on the government system. Uh, there's nobody in that field that even remotely comes close to being as near a libertarian or a conservative as Donald Trump. Now, don't get me wrong. Donald Trump is not really a conservative slash libertarian candidate, and that's one of the reasons that I didn't vote for him in 2016. He's got some authoritarian tendencies that kind of spook me. And even though I thought that it was going to be a lot worse than it was, because he's actually not governed all that authoritarianly, he does have the rhetoric of an authoritarian. But he's drastically slashed things like regulation. The economy has been operating in a more free market mode than it has really in years. He's not been one that has been all in favor of a whole bunch of regulation or government oversight or bailing a bunch of companies out. Now, the one economic policy where Trump is not very libertarian is on tariffs, and I agree that he's horrible on that. And his default seems to be to be in favor of tariffs, but the Democrats, though they might not necessarily be in favor of that, they are in favor of all the other economic controls. So I don't see how anybody gets to the point to where, oh, well, Trump's not even close to a libertarian or a conservative, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to vote for the least libertarian, least conservative person that I can. I'm sorry, that that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And here's this next graphic uh, from Bill Kristol, who ran a conservative magazine for it. Now, he's really more establishment GOP, and that's the reason that he doesn't really like Trump. So very different motivation from Joe Walsh. But he says, not presumably forever, not perhaps for a day after November 3rd, 2020, the day after Election Day, not on every issue or in every way until then, but for the time being, one has to say, we are all Democrats now. And so Bill Kristol, more of the establishment Republicans that really don't like Trump because he's not one of their guys, he's not one of the big business, uh, chamber of crony capitalism Uh, all about some government bailouts, interventionalist when it comes to warfare. That's what he doesn't like about Trump. Now, Joe Walsh, at least if we're believing what he says he believes in, if we're taking him at face value, says that he's very libertarian. So the exact opposite, he doesn't like Trump because he's not conservative enough, not because he's not establishment enough like Bill Kristol. But these are two examples of people that have allowed their own personal animus towards the president 
that they had back then when he was kind of an unknown carry over into long after the president has done overall a fairly good job. He's been very good for the pro-life cause, at least as good as somebody that doesn't have Congress really backing him on that can be. He's not been great at cut, cutting spending. He's kind of just given a blank check to Congress and he keeps signing these omnibus bills that continue to increase spending. But at least his proposed budgets that he said he would like to sign if they wound up on his desk have included significant cuts. He's been very good for the military. He's been excellent, excellent at cutting regulation. That's the thing that I think he gets an A-plus on. And you look at the two Supreme Court justices he's nominated. Kavanaugh is much more of a loose cannon, and we're not real sure where he is. I think that he's, based on everything that I've seen, more conservative than Roberts, at least, which is, you know, moving the court at least slightly in the right direction, considering Kennedy was slightly left of Roberts. And then Gorsuch, who, by every indication that we've gotten so far, is the second coming of Antonin Scalia. Are you really so blinded by your dislike of the man? That you are incapable of admitting, admitting when he does something right or when he does something praiseworthy? That you have this animus that you're saying, I'll vote for anybody other than him, even if that person espouses my values to a lesser extent than President Trump just because they're not Trump. That's a completely childish, irrational thing to do. Now, here's the thing. When it all comes down to it, I don't like the false dichotomies. I don't like the, the tribalist rhetoric. I never bought into and still do not buy into the idea that well, you have to vote for this person or this person. It's a, a choice between two people and you have to pick the lesser of two evils. I don't like that argument. I never have. I think that if you capitulate to voting for the lesser of two evils, you're still voting for evil. And so I've never bought into that argument. But what I don't understand even more, what I think is even more absurd and illogical than the lesser of two evils doctrine, is this doctrine. Because... It's almost like they're advocating voting for the greater of two evils. That doesn't make any sense. Now, I didn't vote for President Trump in 2016 because I did not feel that he was sufficiently conservative enough. But I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. That would be even worse. That would be voting for the greater of two evils. It doesn't make any sense. And I think that what this does, I think that really what it all boils down to is, yeah, Trump is not only incredibly imperfect, but he's not really somebody that fits into that libertarian slash conservative mindset. He's not an ideologue. He doesn't do everything that we would like him to do. And, and I'm not trying to make excuses for him when he screws up or does something that doesn't make sense. I call him out on it. I've always done that. But if that's where you're coming from, and you're looking at him, and because you're upset that he's not that, you're willing to vote for somebody that's even less of that, then you, by your own definition, are not really a conservative slash libertarian. Because you're, you're voting for something that is as far in the opposite that you possibly can. There is nothing further opposite of libertarianism or conservatism than somebody that is a full-on self-proclaimed socialist that wants to nationalize all of our major industries and provide universal health care, universal education. There's nothing more anti-libertarian than that. There's nothing more anti-small government than that. And that leaves us with only one conclusion. This particular person, both Joe Walsh and Bill Crystal, for different reasons, but ultimately arriving at the same conclusion, their Trump derangement syndrome is so rabid, and they hate the man so much, they are willing to jettison all of their rational thought in order to do anything they can to hurt him. And that doesn't make any sense, but ultimately that's what hatred is. See, the reason hatred is so deadly, the reason that is so poisonous, is because ultimately it blinds you, it clouds your judgment, and it causes you to do things that violate your own principles and your own standards. And yeah, that's true in politics, but 
What I also want you to remember is that this is an example of what personal hatred can do in your life. It can cause you to do things that hurt yourself just to spite the other person. And that's why I say conclusively, even though I I rarely do this with anybody, left or right, political, non-political, whatever, I rarely say it's obvious to me that this person, person A, hates person B. But I'm looking at the data here, I'm, I'm looking at the evidence that has put it before me in these tweets, and I can't think of any other logical explanation for why somebody would intentionally do something that is in contradiction to their own beliefs that would harm them just in order to stick it to somebody else. Frankly, hatred is the only logical explanation for why someone would be willing to do that, and that is why even though I think that it bears a, there's a moral to the story here and there's a lesson to be learned in the political realm. More importantly, this should be a frightening testament to what hatred can do in your life, personally as well. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps under the command of General George Washington Each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today our Chaplain's Report comes from the book of Leviticus. And I've been reading through Leviticus for the past few days. And to be perfectly frank with you, and I mentioned this, I think, earlier in a chaplain's report that I've just been reading through the entire Bible this year. My church has a program where we're all going to read through the Bible together, which I think is is really great. Unfortunately, I haven't seen as many people doing that as I'd hoped. I was hoping the whole congregation would do it. It seems as though only a handful of us have. But I think it's really cool that the whole church can kind of be on the same page and have, having recently read the same scriptures, can kind of discuss those. But the thing about doing a a yearly Bible reading plan is that usually, at least what I've seen in Christians, they're reading through Genesis and they're fine. Genesis is interesting. I mean, you've got everything from the creation of the world to the flood to uh, the goings-on between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then eventually Joseph. And then you get to Exodus 400 years later, Oh, there's all kinds of excitement there. You've got Moses and the Ten Commandments and the parting of the Red Sea and the Ten Plagues. And I mean, it just goes on and on and it's action-packed up until about halfway through Exodus. And then all of a sudden it's law. There's nothing wrong with law. And there's quite a few things that we as modern Christians can pick up from the old law reading the Torah. But you have to dig a lot deeper for that. And let's be honest, the narrative's not there anymore, and so the reading, it can still be interesting, it can still be enlightening, but it's not as quick-paced, it's not something that grabs our attention. And then you get to Leviticus, man. There are parts of Leviticus that, again, spiritually enlightening, they're here for a reason, God has them preserved for us, and he has spiritual messages still contained within the law. But let's be honest, it's not exactly a page-turner. And that's where a lot of Christians fall off, and I think they make a mistake there. And I get that it's it's not always super easy to get through some of the uh, the parts of Leviticus. Just as a as somebody that considers themselves a Bible scholar, there's parts of it that aren't exactly thrilling to me either that I kind of have to force myself to read. I mean, you get into which stone goes in which position on the ephod, you know, it's not exactly something that is engaging to a modern reader that never saw that stuff or doesn't have a Jewish heritage, and and so it's a little harder for us to relate to that part of the Bible. But the thing is, that doesn't stop it from being incredibly spiritually profound. Because, ultimately, God's laws were put in place for a reason. Now, some of those reasons are more obvious than others, and some of them have a direct carryover into the New Testament, while some, frankly, just don't. But there's a great verse that speaks to sort of this theme in Leviticus. 
And near the tail end of Leviticus, in Leviticus 26, there is a passage there in verse 43, and we'll read 43 through 45, where the book of Leviticus says, For the land will be abandoned by them, talking, of course, about Israel, and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity, because they rejected my ordinances, and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So, the truth is, that little three-verse passage there has a wealth of spiritual information in it. And to fully grasp what he's talking about there, and I think it's pretty obvious that you can pick up on the context just by reading what God is talking about, is this comes right at the tail end of a lengthy book about all the different rules and regulations and statutes that must be followed by God's people. It was part of the covenant that they originally made, part of the covenant that Moses made with God on Sinai. And the people all agreed to it. It wasn't like Moses just did this on his own. All of the people heard this and agreed to do it. They made a covenant. They made a sacred promise with God that, yes, Lord, we will do what you ask us to do. We will keep your laws. We will follow your law, and it will be our guide. Now, did they hold up to that promise? Not really. But the point is, they did make that covenant originally. And what God said to them was, if you keep your part of the covenant, I will bless you. And he gives them a long list of things that are going to happen, that they'll be prosperous, that they're not going to have to worry about robbers or vagabonds or conquerors of other nations, that they would be safe and secure. He never says they're not going to have any problems or that everything's always going to be perfect, but he does make them a promise that if you do your best, if you try to follow my laws, as long as you do that, then I'm going to be with you. I am going to be your God. You will be able to rely on me and your nation is going to be blessed. You see, the New Testament is very different because God makes that covenant with each and every one of us and we make it with him through his son on a very personal level. And it's not that God didn't have a personal relationship with each individual Israelite, but that's not what's being discussed here. What's being discussed here is how Israel behaves as a nation, that if their people keep his laws and keep his commands and do what is right, well, then eventually what's going to happen is God is going to bless them as a nation, as a people. All of the things that a nation would want, prosperity, security, all of those things, God is going to take care of as long as they keep his covenant. But you'll notice that all of this is 100% conditional. And in that verse that we just read, you get the idea of what's going to happen if Israel breaks that covenant. That their land is going to be abandoned. If you don't keep the covenant that I have with you, then the promise that I made to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. You're not going to be able to use that land to the fullest of its extent, whether you're taken off of it and have to be somewhere else, which, by the way, happened to the children of Israel, unfortunately, kind of frequently. If you're ever taken away from that land for a time or a myriad of other things that could happen to it, whether there's war or famine or plague, whatever it is, God's hand of protection is no longer going to be there to keep those terrible things away from you. And if that covenant isn't secured and your end of the bargain is kept up, then I'm not going to hold my end of the bargain up either. You see, this was all conditional language, and I think that that's something that is sobering for us to think about, that God's blessings are a free gift, but a free gift that does have conditions. A free gift that God does say, in order to keep my blessings, in order to hang on to my blessings, 
there does need to be some effort from you. You don't have to earn it. You're not working towards it. The work you're doing is not paying off your debt. But there are some basic conditions that I expect you to uphold on your side so that I uphold my blessings on my side. And if you're looking through this, you'll notice something else. That all of these laws, ultimately they were supposed to lead Israel to spiritual enlightenment. Because in this very passage, what he's talking about here is making amends for the iniquities, and it says that if you abhor my ordinances, if you abhor my statutes, in other words, if you don't do the things that I ask you to do, then your iniquity is not going to be taken away. And of course, he he goes on to predict that all these other terrible things are going to happen to them. But in verse 45, you get a little hint of hope there. Because even after God takes away his hand of protection over them, even after they're not able to take advantage of the land that he promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, even after all this, God doesn't forget them. You see, it's kind of like God is a father, which of course he is. Sometimes you got to punish your kids. Sometimes you got to come down on them pretty hard so that they get the message. And sometimes you have to take away things that you want to give them, you want them to have, you want them to be able to experience and enjoy, but you have to take them away because you know ultimately that's going to make them a better person. And maybe that they'll learn something from it so that they can enjoy those rights and privileges a little bit later when they can when they've proven that they can handle them. But you never forget your kid. You don't say that, okay, you're not my kid anymore. And God doesn't do that either. Because in verse 45, he says, but I will remember, and he's talking about this even in the context of while Israel's being punished, I will remember them for the covenant with their ancestors. And he looks back at the times where he brought them out of the land of Egypt. You see, just like a parent looks back with their child and says, look, this is a person that I raised, if you're the mother, that I gave birth to, that I helped take his first steps, that used to change his diapers. All of those little milestones, looking all the way back at the child's infancy, you don't throw all that away because you're punishing your kid. And that's not what God does with us. The thing is, God wants us to be with him. He wants us to be saved, and he wants us to be better people. And because of that, occasionally, because he has to, because it's a last resort for him, he does punish us by taking away his protection, by taking away the benefits of that covenant, hoping that we're going to realize that it really is a better thing, it's a better idea to do what Israel didn't always do, and keep his statutes and keep his commandments. And if we do that, then God is going to bless us. But even if we don't, even when we screw up, even when we fall away, and God has to allow us to suffer for a time, the whole time he doesn't forget who he is, and he doesn't forget who we are. And he's still looking at us, remembering all the things that we've done to get to this point, and praying that we'll do what Israel, unfortunately, very often did it. Repent of their sins and come back to him asking for forgiveness. Isn't that what any parent wants when they're allowing their kid to be punished? Isn't that really ultimately all that they desire? Is for them to learn from that experience and become stronger afterward so that they don't repeat those same mistakes? Because that's what God really wants out of us and that's what he wanted from Israel back then. God is the same God he's always been. He doesn't change. And I'm thankful that he doesn't. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020.